As we come into chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, um, I'm very excited about, about this, about chapter 4 and, well, uh, the whole book. And, and remember with me that there is a promise that is given to those who read this book or hear this book. And you remember what the promise is? Jesus said, Blessed are those who read this book or hear this book. And so if, if there is a blessing attached to the reading or, or, or hearing of this particular book of the Bible, then it's got to be important. There's got to be something there that, that, that Jesus wants us to grab a hold of, that he wants us to understand. And, and, and there is a, a way of looking at this that we've gone over and over and over, chapter 1, verse 19. It's the, it's the divine outline of this book. Now, we're, we're, we started with verse 1, uh, chapter 1. We went through... Um, we saw Jesus Christ. When, then we went into chapter 2, verse 1, and went through chapter 3, verse 22. We saw the church age, and we went through the history of the church and some other things that kind of formulates for us where we are right now with the church of Laodicea. And some church of, uh, some, some Philadelphian churches mixed in there, maybe some Sardis churches in there. And that's going to be what it's going to look like until... Jesus steps out on the cloud and calls his church home. We call that the rapture. Now, you can look in uh, the dictionary of your Bible and you won't find the word rapture per se. There are other words that are used. And, of course, if you have a Latin Bible, it's rapturo. It, it's, it's there, uh, but it's, it's the, the, the meaning of the word that we will put handles on today. So, suffice it to say, there is something substantially different between chapter 3 and chapter 4. Um, there's a lot different between chapter 3 and chapter 4. Have you ever thought about the rapture? Have you ever thought about what's going to happen during the rapture? Now, let me divide this into two sections, okay? Last week, um, I went off script and um, shared with you uh, my heart and something that I had um, tightened up on in the way that we look at, at hell. And, and hell is, is, is uh, the absence of God's grace, but it's the presence of God's wrath. If you are not part of the church, if you're not a, a member of the family of God, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ for who he is and what he has done in your life, then you are an enemy of God. And what awaits you is God's wrath. It's not a, it's, it's not a, it's not a myth this is not something that somebody just wrote and, and you know, um, thought it would make a really great, um, scary movie. Um, this, is, this is for real. This is actually what Jesus says is going to happen. And so if you think about it, and, and there's no way that I can do it justice this morning, but, but if you think about it, when the rapture happens, there's going to be a lot going on in this world. Um, I've asked the question before, and I've gotten all kinds of answers. You know, what, what do you think will take place immediately after the rapture? The rapture happens in the blink of an eye, which is less than a second. I think it's like one eighteen thousandth of a second, something like that. I mean, it's, just, it's very fast. People have said, well, there's going to be mass confusion. Well, you can imagine that, you know. Uh, you think about some of these busy interstates and, and these people get raptured and their cars are everywhere and buses and planes and ships and all kinds of stuff. 
And so there's going to be mass confusion. There's going to be hysteria. There's going to be chaos of all kinds. I believe that there's going to be probably people who had a chance to accept Christ, but didn't. They know what's going on, and I think their hearts are going to fail them. You can imagine the headlines the morning after the rapture happens. You know, headlines like, um, uh, people panic all over the world. Um, headlines like, millions missing around the globe. And with the wokeness of this day and age, I'm sure there will be at least one headline that reads something like, aliens have abducted millions. Right? They're not going to want to give in to the fact that the rapture happened, so they're going to blame it on the aliens. Well, you might find articles that read something like this. At 12.05 last night, a telephone operator reported three frantic calls regarding missing relatives. Within 15 minutes, all communications were jammed with similar inquiries. A spot check around the nation found that same situation in every city. Sobbing husbands sought information about the mysterious disappearance of wives. One husband reported, I turned on the light to ask my wife if she remembered to set the clock, and she was gone. Her bedclothes were there. Her watch was on the floor. She had vanished. Oh, that, that gave me cold chills all over. <laughs> Whew. Or something like this, you know. Um, an alarmed caller from Brooklyn tearfully reported, My husband just returned from the late shift. I kissed him, and he just disappeared in my arms. Whew. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Or something like this. Thousands of coronary victims have died since the news was released concerning the multitudes who are missing. In Chicago, the General Hospital was the scene of multiple heart attack victims. Fifty-five bodies were taken to the morgue for identification in Los Angeles and New York. It was reported that as many as 300 deaths from heart failure per hour are being called into the local hospitals. You can imagine what's going to happen in this world whenever the rapture happens. Now, so, so listen, so, so th this is for real. <laughs> this is going to happen. I will stake my life on it. This will happen. And when it happens, there, there are no newspapers, there are no television stations, there are no radio stations, there, there are no social media outlets that will be able to handle reporting the magnitude of this event. This is the next event on the prophetic calendar. Nothing else has to happen before the rapture. Nothing. We're, we're in the barrel loaded, so to speak. The next thing that happens is the rapture of the church. It's not mentioned specifically by name, as I said earlier, but it is clear, clearly indicated in chapter 4. There is one explanation for the shift in the emphasis from chapter 3, the church age, to chapter 4, and that is the rapture had to happen. And we're going to look at several facts that will help us to kind of put handles on this and, and to, to shore this up, uh, establish a strong truth about the rapture of the church. So let's look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read these for you, but we're not going to make it through verse 11. Actually, I called Cliff last night and I said, well, I'm going to read 1 through 11. I'm going to try to hit 1 through 3, but I'm probably going to get to verse 1. So, let's read it. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. 
And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. Carnelian is a uh, 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 reddish brown stone. Some, some Bibles have Sardis, and, and that's a little bit darker. And around the throne was a rainbow that had, a, had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes and lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, uh, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion. The second living creature like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Wow. What a, what a scene. What an event. So my first point today is, is just a little bit about the rapture of the church. There's a commentary... Um, on the type of changes that have to take place uh, when the church is raptured, when our earthly bodies are rejoined with our souls and, 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 and we receive our glorified bodies. And this is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 53. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 53. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must, be, must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. So something drastic happens between chapter 3 and chapter 4. Chapters 2 and chapters 3 were all about the church age. And, 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 and the, the rapture of the church takes place when the fullness, whenever the church age is complete. And so we know that there's a structural change that has to take place in this book. Or, or, and, and we have to embrace it, honestly, because if we don't, we're going to be lost for the rest of our journey through the rest of the book of Revelation. So in order to chronologically continue to, to pull these events together, uh, we've got to be aware that something transpired between chapter 3 and chapter 4. If we look at it, the scenery has changed. The scenery has changed from earth to heaven. Uh, there is an open door into heaven. We will not find the church, the bride of Christ, on earth. It's not mentioned anymore until we get later in the book, but even then it is found in heaven. It will be found as the bride of Christ in heaven. And these are the overcomers. Uh, chapters 2 and chapter 3, one of, the, one of the big things that Jesus was saying, for the overcomers I will do this, and for the overcomers I will do that. And, and I believe what has transpired is nothing less than the rapture of the church. It's the only possible explanation. And if you lay out the timelines, the rapture of, uh, of the church before the tribulation period starts, is the only one that makes sense. The only timeline that makes sense. And we'll get into it later as we come across some other scriptures. So let's establish this just a little bit more. The Bible interprets itself very well. Point number two is this. The sequence of events in the book of Revelation. 
By the time we reach chapter 4, verse 1, we've completed the first two sections. If you remember, section 1 was um, about Jesus Christ. Section 2 was about the churches. And let me just, just read to you again um, chapter 1, verses 17 through 19 to, to encapsulate the outline. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death in Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, chapter 1, those that are, chapter 2, chapter 3, and those that are to take place after this. Take place after this. Take place after this. Those that are to take place after this. After this. After the church age. He's telling John, Jesus is telling John, write those things that are going to take place after the church age. The Greek word is metatauta, M-E-T-A-T-A-U-T-A, metatauta. And if you look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, in that outline, it says, take place after this, that's that Greek phrase, metatauta. But in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, the same phrase is used. After this, I looked... Metatauta, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. So grammatically speaking, this chapter 4, verse 1, is being tied back to the last part, the C part of verse 19 in chapter 1. These are referring to the same thing. So the things John is now going to write about are those things that will happen after the church age, which is also called the age of grace or the throne of grace, um, chapters 2 and chapters 3. So after the age of the church on earth, the attention in God's word and emphasis in God's word is shifted now to the church in heaven. To the church in heaven. Point number three is this, the silence concerning the church in heaven. So this is very interesting. Revelation chapters 4 through 19 talk about one thing in its entirety. 4 through 19 talk about tribulation on earth. Tribulation on earth. Chapters 4 and 5 introduce the tribulation period. And then chapter 6 through 19 is, is God pouring out his wrath on the earth. God pouring out his wrath on the earth. And it's going to be serious. God pouring out his wrath. Now let me ask you this. Do you think God would be pouring out his wrath on the earth including the church in that wrath? No. No, not at all. Not at all. As a matter of fact, if the church were still here during the tribulation period, you would read about it. John would, would have written about it because the church would have to undergo horrible circumstances. And we're going to get into some of these, and it's just, going to, it's just going to blow your mind. The wrath of God on this earth upon those people who are his enemies. So if the church were, were anything, any, it, it were involved on earth at all, we would be reading about it. But it's not. It's not. There's, there's another little phrase that, that uh, John wrote uh, for each of the seven churches, and, and it was, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the churches. That phrase is used somewhat, again, in chapter 13, verse 9. But look how it's rewritten. In chapter 13, verse 9, it says, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Now, people have asked me before, Okay, so, so the church is raptured, goes to heaven. What about those people on earth? Are there going to be people who are going to be saved on earth? Yes, they will. They will. It's not, though, like it is in the church age, where the church is given the invitation to come, and the Holy Spirit is working within those people to come, being called. Whenever you get to the tribulation period, those that will be saved will be individuals like in the Old Testament. They will prove their faith like in the Old Testament, individuals, not the church. However, whenever 
you prove your faith to Jesus Christ during the tribulation period, you will be martyred. You'll lose your life because of your declaration of faith. So how do we know where the church is? The door was open. And John was called up. And we're going to see marvelously, we're going to see through John's eyes, the church interacting in heaven. Now, this is important because there are those religious groups that, that will remain nameless this morning that, um, that take passages between chapter 6 and chapter 22 out of context. They, they, they try to, they try to, to um, include the church into the tribulation period. It, it, it doesn't work. As a matter of fact, if you try to do that, or if, if you try to extend the church age into the tribulation period, then you're, you're actually doing damage to the Scripture because it's out of context, and the Scripture doesn't say that. Point number four, the Spirit of God transfers from earth to heaven. The Spirit of God is in the midst of the churches. Why is the Spirit of God in the midst of the churches? Because the Spirit lives within Christians. And those Christians are part of the church. And if Christians are there, the Holy Spirit is there. The work of the Holy Spirit is there working through those Christians in the church. But chapter 4 says, There were seven lamps burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Part of the triune God that dwells within the believers now is in heaven with the overcomers. The Spirit of God is in heaven because the overcomers are in heaven. So let's look at, 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 at one particular scripture. It's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6 and 8. 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 8. You know what's happening in the, in the, in the tribulation period is this, this lawless one, the Antichrist, is revealed. Right? And Satan works through the Antichrist and tries to to uh, basically um, do damage toward God and God's people, Israel. The time of the tribulation is for Israel. The Gentiles have already had their time. The church age has already come and gone. The rapture happens. Now the tribulation period is for Israel. And so we see in 2 Thessalonians 2, chapters, uh, chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, how the, the evil one, the lawless one, is going to be revealed. Verse 6, And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only who he who now restrains, it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So, What's keeping the lawless one, the wicked one, the evil one from being revealed? The restrainer. When will the wicked one be revealed? When the restrainer is removed. When will the restrainer be removed? When the believers, the overcomers, are removed. When the restrainer is removed... And the evil one is revealed. There will be tribulation on earth. And even if God didn't design it, the tribulation that's going to happen on earth is, is all hell is going to break loose. Because you have man left to himself. This can only happen because the Holy Spirit who indwells all the Christians and who is the salt and light to the earth is removed from this earth as a result of Christians being removed from this earth. Point number five, and this is my last point. A voice, a trumpet, and an open door. So, when you need answers to questions of the Bible, where's the most logical place to go? To the Bible. <laughs> to the Bible. So there are a couple of places in the Bible that talk about the rapture of church, uh, of the church, in addition to Revelation 4. Let's look at, I'm going to look at two. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 4 uh, verses 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Very operative word there, hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We're going to be caught up to be with him in the air. Notice that at this juncture, at this point in time, the rapture of the, of the church is Jesus coming out on the cloud. He doesn't come back to earth. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. He comes out on the cloud and he catches us up to be with him in the clouds. Those who are dead arise first. They're rejoined with their glorified bodies, and then we who are alive will get our glorified bodies, and we will join them with him in the air. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 47 through 57. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust, and as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have been born the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me go back and just, just reiterate verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4. After this, I looked. After this, meditata. I looked, and behold, a door standing open, in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. In verse 1, the word, uh, some, of your, some of your translations have the word was, and some of them have standing. The, 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 the phrase there, standing open, is not really present in the original transcripts. Uh, it says, a door opened in heaven. A door opened in heaven. After this I looked. Greek word, metatautal, from Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. So there's some similarities here. Um, uh, Revelation 4, 1 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, there is this voice of the Lord that is present. Uh, Revelation 4, 1, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, there's the sounding of the trumpet of God. Revelation 4, 2 and 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and 53, there's this change from physical to spiritual. Physical to spiritual. And the voice that John hears says, come up here. You think John had any, uh, any say-so in the matter? 
No, no, he didn't. The voice said, come up here. And, and, and it's the Greek word, um, harpazo. It's, it's H-A-R-P-A-Z-O, harpazo. Harpazo is how it's pronounced, harpazo. And, and this means to seize, to catch away, to catch up, to pluck, to pull, or to take by force. So it's not like he's just casually going to climb, you know, Jacob's ladder. No, 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 no. It's, it's, more, like, it's more like Jesus reaches down and grabs him by the, by the nook of the neck and just jerks him up here and says, come up here. I'm not messing with you. Get up here. I got stuff to show you. And so he goes up. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 and 4. 2 Corinthians 12, 2 and 4. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was called up. There's that word again, harpazo. Called up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body. I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. One more. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up, harpazo, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. There's a Hebrew word that goes along with this. It's yalak, yalak. It's um, Y-A-L-A-K. And it means to be carried away, to be led in a departure, to, to exodus or to leave, a vanishing. And this is the Hebrew equivalent of the phrase caught up. So it's all in the Bible. It's, it's, it's written time and time and time again. And, and, and it's there for us to understand. The book of Revelation, a lot of people won't go there. A lot of preachers won't preach it. Uh, uh, people, it seems like people are afraid to read it because they're, they're like, oh, I can't understand the book of Revelation. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Furthermore than that, do you want a blessing? Read it. Jesus said it. Not me. I'm just, I'm just delivering the message. Read it and be blessed. All right, here's, here's the closing. We need to make note of a couple of things that, that we're going to discover what uh, the church will encounter in heaven. The first thing is an open door. Verse 1, after this I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. A door open in heaven. And, and, and so why is this door open in heaven? Because he wants us to understand what's going on in heaven. He wants us to see what's taking place in heaven while there is tribulation on earth. He wants us to see this worship. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, wor worship is the primary activity in heaven. There's going to be a lot of worship. There's going to be a lot of music. There's going to be lots of cymbals and horns and all kinds of stuff going on. Multitudes and multitudes and, 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 and myriads upon myriads of, like, like, like an ocean of people will be worshiping the Lamb. And so... If, if you come to church, now, I'm not, I'm not getting on to anybody, okay? But I, I just want you to, to hear me. If you come to church, and you're sitting there, and you're worried about somebody sitting around you, hearing you sing and worship, and, and opening your heart of praise to God, you're going to be real uncomfortable when you get to heaven. Because they ain't going to care. And you shouldn't care. Pastor Cliff tells of this precious story of him worshiping in church one Sunday. And this lady sitting in front of him turned around with this scour look on her face like, what is that? You know, I think if I had been Pastor Cliff, I probably would have turned the volume up. Get used to it, woman. 
It's going to be like that in heaven. It's going to be wonderful in heaven. So whenever you come in here, don't worry about the person sitting next to you. Don't worry about if they can sing or not or you can sing or not. It's not, honestly, I'll just be, I'll just be honest. It's not about you. You know, this world does not revolve around you. It's not about you. It's not about them. Who's it about? It's about offering worship to Jesus. God tells us that, that the, 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 the prayers of the saints rise before him as a sweet-smelling incense. And that's what we want. We want to worship him in spirit and truth. And, and, and that he would receive it as, as a sweet-smelling incense, pleasing to him. You know? That when, when I get to heaven, I'd love for Jesus to come up to me and say, you know them, them people at the church of the mountain? Man, they can sing. They can worship. And it was so pleasing to me. That's what I want. So finally, the key word in chapter 4 is this, throne. If you look, at, if you look at, at the book of Revelation, the word throne is used 46 times. It's used 12 times in, in chapter 4. So you really want to grasp this chapter, go through and, and highlight in your Bible everywhere the word throne is mentioned. You might come up with some kind of little picture that looks like a throne or something like that and just draw it over in the margin of your Bible so that whenever you're scanning through there, you can see throne, 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 throne. It'll make a big difference. It'll help you see what the chapter is all about. So listen, what, why, why is all of this teaching so important? Why is this teaching so important for us? Why is, is studying the book of Revelation so important Vitally important for us. It's because the doctrine of the rapture brings the believer hope. How many of you have had loved ones or friends that have passed on and you know they're in heaven? Just about everybody here has experienced that. And so, it, it, you have a longing in you to be reunited with those that have gone on. Why is that? Why, why, why is there this longing to be reunited with those loved ones? Because you've spent years and years and years with them. You've had intimate moments with them where you have lived life with them. You've, you've been able to, to experience the ups and the downs and come out on the other side. And so you have this hope that is available for us. Titus 2.13 says, Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, let me challenge you just for a moment. I, I know, you know, I know we all have loved ones that we want to see again. But who is it that we really should want to see? It is Jesus Christ who we should really want to see. And why should we want to see him? Well, because he paid the price that we couldn't pay. And, and because of his payment, his substitution... We will live eternally in heaven. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. 
You, you can't fathom how big of a deal that is. But, but it, here's something else. Is it maybe because you only have a head knowledge of Jesus Christ and you kind of only love him because you are told by your pastor that you should love Jesus? Is it? Is it? Is it maybe because you haven't lived a life experiencing an intimate relationship with Jesus on a daily basis? Is it maybe because you go throughout the day challenged by things that you feel like you have to do that day and, and you don't take an opportunity to s just to sit and say, Jesus, I love you. One thing that I've learned is You need to take advantage of every opportunity. To tell those who are very special to you in your life. How much you love them. And there is none other any more special. Than Jesus Christ. Whenever Diane would have a hard day, and she would just be ready to give it all up, I'd remind her it's not time yet. Let's enjoy today, and we'll face tomorrow whenever tomorrow gets here. And sweetheart, I love you more than anybody else in this world loves you. And we'd make it through the day. Can we get up the next day and we'd face it, whatever it was. So I said all that to say this. We need to tighten up in our relationship with Jesus Christ and not just take advantage of the fact that he went to the cross as part of God's plan to pay the price that we couldn't pay. To die the death that, that we couldn't die. To do the things that had to be done on our behalf so that we could go to heaven. That's just kind of along for the ride. No. We need to approach Jesus as the person who loves us more than anybody else that we will ever know. My last scripture, and then I'll close with prayer. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. Because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes, 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 hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. So why go through the book of Revelation and 
learn of all these things that's going to happen in heaven while tribulation happens on the earth and how all of this is going to wind up because there is this wonderful hope that we all have and we all need to be prepared for it. We all need to understand what God's plan is and He has it right there for us. To put handles on and enjoy life wide open and uh, live more intimately with Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we just... Oh my goodness, we... We are captivated by your grace and your mercy. We, Father, uh, in a sense, we just, we just fall before your throne. And we worship you. We thank you for your glory and, 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 and things that just seemingly encapsulate us. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for your steadfast love that is new every day. Father God, I pray that you would continue to lead God and direct us. I pray that you would just rip the blinders from our eyes and from our minds and allow us to, to just absorb, to soak up this word, this message that you have for us. And Father, not only that, but to, to understand it in such a way that we can turn around and share it with others. Prepare us for the days to come. Do a mighty work within us, Father God. Accept our worship as a sweet-smelling incense that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.